Buenasera. Thank you very minutes, much. Ten minutes, please. Ten minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I'll keep it as short as possible. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation to the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam and our friends. Uh, you have a beautiful beach here, although I would hazard to say that we have even better ones back in the Philippines. Um, but I think it's too late to apply for Minister of Tourism under the new administration. Nonetheless, I'll quickly talk about the new administration in the Philippines and its approach to the South China Sea, but also about ASEAN. And just to preface my very short presentation today, let me say that you know we in ASEAN I always say we don't want to make a choice between U.S. and China. But the reality is that not making a choice is a choice in itself. And over time, it's going to be very difficult, if not a luxury, for us to keep the principle of neutrality on this kind of position. So I think we have to be brutally honest about the situation we're going to face. Let me also say that we have to make a distinction between ASEAN as an organization and ASEAN members and the core members and what they can accomplish together and in coordination with like-minded countries. Let me hazard to say that if you're looking at the ASEAN as an organization itself, perhaps it's best described as a small and medium enterprise without human rights charter, right? The, the abilities of ASEAN as an organization to deal with the challenges in the region is limited, but I think ASEAN countries, if they work together on a minilateral level, we can achieve a lot. And that's why we have to work with alternative partners. Now, let me quickly go through this. I, is this, is this, okay, I only have 10 minutes, so just quickly feel free to just put my name and any topic I'm gonna discuss, something is gonna pop up, right? Whether it's a journal article or whether it's a popular article. So let me quickly go to my presentation per se. First of all, let me say, as far as the South China Sea is concerned, as far as the discourse about South China Sea is concerned, we have seen a very interesting evolution over the past decade. I remember back in the mid 2010s, let's just call it the Hugh White School of Thought was very prevalent. This kind of strategic fatalism that as far as the first island chain is concerned, forget about it, let's focus on the second island chain. Of course, it's easy for you to say when you're down under and not in somewhere like in the Philippines or Vietnam or Japan. Now the conversation is very, very different. We notice that in Canberra, we notice that in the United States among many of our friends and allies across the region, there's no longer that kind of strategic fatalism. And for all the criticism we can make of Trump, including the fact that he's keeping us awake because of his announcement for presidency a while ago. Um, the fact of the matter is that America's policy towards South China Sea has become much more forthcoming and much more robust over the past five to six years. And we saw that especially with former Secretary Pompeo's statement on the South China Sea, America's position on the South China Sea, but more importantly also the clarification of the clear boundaries and coordinates of Philippine-US alliance in the context of South China Sea disputes. And gladly, as far as the Biden administration is concerned, it continued the better elements, the better nature, better angels of the nature of the Trump administration policy, although changing tactics and more focus on multilateralism. Over the past five to 10 years, we also see a lot of our partners from the outside the region, especially our partners in the European Union, Quad, uh, Britain, who's no longer part of the European Union, among others, getting more involved. And we see that more in these events that we're organizing. We see more friends from Germany, from Europe, from all across the world. And I think that's a good thing. We're not expecting our European friends to conduct freedom of navigation operations like Americans. We're not expecting them to be acting like treaty allies because they don't have a treaty alliance with the claimant states in this part of the world. But just their presence there, just their coordinated emphasis on the finality of the UNCLOS ruling of 2016, in itself counts a lot because it dispels the myth, the Chinese driven line, that the South China Sea dispute is an intramural between major powers. It is not. It's a question of international law. It's a question of the rights of smaller countries and sovereign states like the Philippines, Vietnam, among others, protecting their sovereign rights in the South China Sea based on international law. So we really appreciate it when our partners from Europe across the world keep on re-emphasizing that and pushing back against this rhetoric that this is all a new Cold War and nothing less or nothing more. At the same time, let's also be brutally honest about the nature of the kind of scramble on the ground we're facing. At the onset of COVID-19 pandemic, we saw that, for instance, America could not project power the way it wanted to. Joint military exercises with the Philippines, among others, were postponed for quite some time, right? We saw even an American aircraft carrier being bogged down because of COVID-19 infections. Now, that was precisely also the time where we saw China making big announcements and big moves in the South China Sea. 
And if that doesn't tell you about the nature of the challenges you face on the ground, I don't know where you're living and what kind of ostrich strategy you want to pursue for the foreseeable future. Uh, I'm glad, by the way, to have a Chinese fellow panelist. It's been quite a while, so I look forward to Professor Wu Xishun's uh, uh, intervention later on. I can see my um, moderator is looking at me. Why this is not working? Can we go to the next? Okay, this is... Jesus. Where? Here? Oh, here, yeah, okay. Okay. Now, as far as the Philippine, Philippines is concerned, let me just say it's a long story, okay? Oh, you can just read my books and articles about it. But let me use a bit of a Hegelian term. I think as far as President Marcus Jr., the new Philippine president, is concerned, it's a kind of a negation of a negation situation. On one hand, he's negating the seeming or real strategic subservience we saw under President Duterte. And I kind of predicted, actually, before even he became the president, despite a lot of skepticism by a lot of our colleagues and friends. But at the same time, it's not a return to the kind of liberal foreign policy under the more reformist presidents we had in the past, because clearly it's not a U.S.-centric foreign policy. In many ways, I would say the Philippines today is more like fellow ASEAN countries than Mexico, right? I mean, for a very long time, if you look at the Philippine foreign policy, it was not as balanced as many of our neighbors, like Vietnam, Indonesia, and Singapore. It was much more focused on the United States and Alliance, and much con more confrontational towards China. But now that's changing. And in many ways, I would say Marcus Jr. is more like his father, rather than the previous president, Rodrigo Duterte, which we call Tatay, or the father of the nation. Now, is this going to keep on sabotaging me? Um, I okay, have the moderator. Okay, let me really go to the meat of my discussion. My contention is that whoever tells you ASEAN is X, Y, Z, they don't know what they're talking about. Because if you really bother to look at the history of ASEAN, not over the past 10 years, not over the past 20 years, but over the past half a century, ASEAN has gone through tremendous amounts of evolution and has done many things outside the box. In fact, the fact that ASEAN it claims to be you know, respecting principle of non-intervention, that it's based on consensus. That's not backed up by the empirical evidence. For instance, we can see in the past that, for instance, uh, majority-based decision making. In short, the argument I'm making here is that we have to think outside the box, and ASEAN has been operating outside the box over the years. So when you say ASEAN is just this or that, you're missing the point that means you don't even know the ASEAN's history itself. So whenever in ASEAN we had decisive leaders, we were able to have decisive response. And I believe in many ways, ASEAN's inaction, dithering, and divisions is also a reflection of lack of a core leadership.
or decisive leadership. You don't believe me instead of being bogged down by this cult of dialogue, which is going nowhere, right? And lastly, yes, moderator, lastly, I think it's also time to talk about the squad. Everyone talks about quad. Now, of course, when people mentioned first quad, they had Singapore plus quad. But 